Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 14. This is our first chapter that we'll be discussing this semester and what's really important about um, this chapter being first is that it's really a way for us to start to identify how chemists in real life identify molecules, how do we visualize them, how do we do a reaction in the lab and then say we did it correctly, <laughs> right? Like how do we know when we mix two clear liquids together that we actually did the right chemistry. Um, and so that is with two different types of uh, instrumentation in this chapter, infrared spectroscopy and mass spectrometry. We're gonna be talking about these two in chapter 14. Um, in the next chapter, in chapter 15, we'll talk about nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is NMR. That is uh, the gold standard of organic chemistry, if you will. Um, and all three of these techniques in chapter 14 and 15 will encompass our first unit of visualizing organic chemistry molecules. Let's go ahead and dive in. Now, spectroscopy is going to be uh, something that involves that interaction between matter or organic molecule and light, something out of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, we dived into the electromagnetic spectrum a little bit in general chemistry. Um, if you remember things like E equals HC over lambda or E equals H nu uh, frequency, velocity or frequency and wavelength um, were all ways to measure the energy of a wavelength or a measure of the energy of light. And so um, what we were looking at in these is the, the essentially the, um, the particle nature of, um, of light, what we call photons, right? We know that light has wave particle duality, um, but it's really in this that we're trying to measure the energy of, of that, um, that wave. So properties of light waves include the wavelength, lambda, frequency, nu, uh, or that script DV, if you wanna call it that. Uh, wavelength is inversely proportional to energy. That's what we see up here. As wavelength increases, energy decreases because wavelength is in the denominator. Uh, frequency, is directly proportional to energy. As frequency increases, energy increases. And that's because frequency is in the numerator. So mathematically, we know the proportionalities. We are going to talk a little bit about these. We won't be doing the calculations, but what we wanna be able to look at is in the electromagnetic spectrum, where are we working? Where in our instrumentation are we actually identifying anything. Um, I like to bring up this because things in real life obviously are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Microwaves and radio waves are the things that have the highest wavelength. Remember, at higher the wavelength, lower the energy, right? So your microwave or your radio is not going to emit any energy that will harm you. Um, where it lies is at the very, very high end of the wavelength spectrum, right? Low energy over there um, around 10 to the 13 hertz. Remember one hertz is one per second, seconds to the minus one. Uh, or you can think about it as something that is greater than 50 micrometers. Remember that little micro symbol right there. Again, that's 50 times 10 to the negative six meters, if you're thinking about the wavelength. Um, IR, infrared spectroscopy, that's what we're gonna do first. That resides very close to uh, our microwave and radio wave frequencies. Um, it's getting closer to the visible spectrum, right? Um, so lower wavelength, higher frequency, so therefore higher energy, right? Let's just write high energy over here. Now, um, when we're looking at uh, infrared spectroscopy, we are going to be pummeling our, our molecule with IR radiation, uh, light energy in this range. You can say two uh, micrometers to 50 micrometers. We can convert that to nanometers if you wish as well. Um, it's 2,000 nanometers to 50 thousand nanometers if you can do that conversion in your head right so when we're looking at uh how how much energy we're not going to be breaking apart the molecule here that's the biggest thing that i can point out right now we will not 
be uh, breaking up the molecule in any way, shape, or form, but we will be doing something to the molecule that makes it uh, become apparent to us. We're going to make the bonds absorb energy, wiggle, and vibrate, and then when they release energy, we're going to be able to uh, read that release of energy. Now, visible section right here between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. That's all that we can see. Those are the color spectrum, right? This is what our eyeballs will be able to read. We'll talk about this when we get to uh, chapter 16 a little bit more and say, why do some things, some molecules absorb in the visible spectrum? Why is beta carotene orange? Uh, how do our eyeballs work? We'll talk about eyeballs and cones and rods in, in the back of our eyes. And, and why do some molecules work the way they do and produce color? Um, we'll talk also in that chapter 16, a little bit later on, about UV, uh, ultraviolet radiation, and we'll be able to see um, UV in its um, ability to, uh, to uh, identify molecules as well. It's not in this first section because it's not something that uh, strictly is organic chemistry. Um, UV biz is a type of uh, way of looking at molecules in a wide range of of disciplines, um, atmospheric chemistry, um, ocean oceanography, right? Um, my undergrad research was in uh, dissolved organic matter in the ocean water um, and how it photodegradation occurred to produce greenhouse gases and that flux between the, the ocean and air. Um, and then how does it get up into the troposphere and all that stuff with climate change. Um, we used UV vis spectroscopy a lot. Um, and we weren't strictly an organic chemistry lab. Uh, we were more along the lines of an atmospheric organic chemistry. Um, it was after that in grad school that I started doing synthetic organic chemistry chemistry, which was more along the lines of IR radiation, um, mass spectrometry, and NMR. So that's where I kind of shifted and went to the dark side, if you will. Um, but again, lots of different ranges here uh, in terms of UV spectrum, the visible spectrum, the infrared spectrum, and the microwave radio spectrum. What we want to be able to do here is see uh, the that uh, ability of the electromagnetic spectrum to range of all possible frequencies and wavelengths of light. Now, when we're looking at uh, these different regions, again, where are we going to be dealing with? Um, NMR, which we'll deal in chapter 15, deals with radio waves. So very, very low levels. Again, not breaking up the molecule at all, just identifying some things. NMR strictly looks at um, a couple of different atoms. Uh, the atom, we'll talk more in depth later, has to have an odd number of things in its nucleus. Hydrogen, one little proton, no neutrons, has a mass of one. Carbon, the carbon that we look at in NMR is carbon-13. 1.1% of all carbon is carbon-13, that isotope. And so uh, six protons and seven neutrons makes it have an odd number 13 for its mass number in the nucleus. And so uh, NMR is again shooting a small bit of energy at our molecule. We're not doing a reaction at all. We're actually just trying to uh, see how our molecule interacts with small packets of energy. IR spectroscopy, which we're going to do here in chapter 14, uh, uses the infrared spectrum again. What IR is really good at is looking at functional groups present. It'll interact with specific bonds um, and therefore be able to help us identify the, the functional groups in a molecule. It will not tell us anything um, about the structure of the compound, unfortunately. NMR will do that, um, but IR will be able to give us a, a very rugged look of what types of atoms do we have? What types of bonds do we have? Do we have carbon-carbon double bonds? Do we have triple bonds? Do we have oxygens in there? Things like that. UV vis, again, which is chapter 16 in our second unit, it's going to be a very, very small section of spectroscopy there. It's going to be talking about conjugated pi systems, double bonds uh, that are adjacent to each other, connected by single bonds. Conjugated, if we haven't seen that or we don't remember, is a double bond connected uh, to another double bond via a single bond. And so that will be in chapter 16. So if we look at um, a little bit of a review of our general chemistry knowledge here, 
um, matter exhibits particle-like properties, right? It does have everything in nature has wave particle duality, but our matter in our macroscopic world um, appears to just behave as a um, as a particle, right? Uh, and so the wave properties are very difficult to uh, to see. If we look at how a car travels, it looks like it travels straight, right? The molecules in our body look like they're solid and they're stationary. But in reality, matter also exhibits wave-like properties. Matter on the molecular scale exhibits quantum behavior. And so a molecule uh, will only vibrate or rotate at certain rates, at certain energies that we provide it. So it's really spectroscopy is the interaction of matter with light um, with wave-like properties. And so we're really gonna be diving into the wave-like properties here, which is something that we might not have seen before uh, in our organic or in our general chemistry curriculum. So electrons and covalent bonds. We know there are two electrons, right? That make up that shared covalent bond. Vibrational energy levels are separated by gaps. They're quantized. So just like the orbitals around the nucleus that hold the electrons are quantized, right? We have the n equals one, the n equals two, et cetera. And uh, we saw those atomic orbitals become molecular orbitals to make covalent bonds. The molecular orbitals are also quantized. They're at fixed positions at fixed energy levels. And it's the interaction when a photon strikes the molecule what amount of energy is needed to get an electron to excite in a covalent bond, right? And so the IR infrared light generally causes what we have, what we see as molecular vibrations. Different types of bonds will absorb different types of IR energies. Why? Well, because they're made of different atoms, there's different numbers of shared electrons, whether it's a single, a double, a triple, whether it's between two carbons, a carbon and a hydrogen, they're different quantized states. And so we can actually measure uh, either the absorbed energy or the energy that's released, right? We're going to assume that energy is uh, conserved. The absorbed energy is then released from the molecule as heat, right? And so what we are going to be measuring is the amount of energy absorbed by a molecule. Let's look at a couple of types of ways that the bond can vibrate. Now imagine that these uh, green balls are atoms, right? And imagine also that the bonds between them are more like springs, bendable, shape, movable, right? It's something that we might not have thought before. Um, molecular bonds can vibrate and stretch by bending in a couple of different ways a stretching vibration where they're bouncing away from each other, right? Think about this is the center of motion here and the, uh, the two atoms are pulling apart and pushing together, pulling apart and pushing together. So the bond length is slightly changing. Um, we can see an in-plane stretching where it's more like uh, scissors coming together and then pushing back, coming together and pushing back, or an out-of-plane twisting. Right, so kind of like a rotation, like a merry-go-round around twist. Um, we will be focusing on mainly stretching vibrations. But again, these types of vibrations you don't need to describe. What we're just going to be able to do is see how uh, how these bonds um, read out on a spectrum. What happens when we hit the molecule with a whole bunch of energy? What comes out and what's typical? Now, in real life, have you seen IR before? Maybe uh, infrared detectors for alarm systems, night vision goggles use IR light to, uh, to see the heat that is emitted, right? When all of our molecules are absorbing infrared light, all around us there's IR radiation, right? And so our bodies are absorbing that and the molecules in our bodies are releasing it as heat. And so that's how night vision goggles actually work. Um, there is actually uh, some relatively new uh, detections of breast cancer it kind of was stumbled upon accidentally um, in a normal mammogram uh, uh, some um, uh, in a few years ago. I think it was probably closer to five to 10 years ago um, where uh, cancer cells actually multiply more rapidly than healthy cells, right? That's something that has been well known 
in the cancer field, um, the replication of cancer cells happens rapidly. And with that, what happens is there's more heat observed uh, in, in the detection of um, certain cancers. Um, now, the problem here with uh, using IR or thermal imaging to detect cancer is that the cancer cells need to be relatively close to the top or the surface level of the person. It can't be too super uh, inside of us. It has to be more at uh, dermal level. So interesting concept of being able to use IR or thermal imaging, which is a non-invasive uh, detection of cancer. Um, it's not 100% accurate. Uh, they don't use it often. It's more of a rugged technique but still very interesting. Now, the energy necessary to cause vibrations depends on the type of bond. We just said that depending on what kind of bond, uh, what two atoms are in there, how many electrons are being shared, that will all uh, change the quantized energy states. And so the change in energy is going to be dependent on a couple of things. The number of electrons being held in the bond, the bond strength is what we're gonna call that, and the atoms participating in the bond. So here we have two atoms. We have carbon and hydrogen, and you can see their energy state is rather large. The, the change in energy between their uh, ground state and an excited state, the next level, right? Now look at the carbon to oxygen, much smaller gap, right? So when we're thinking about these changes in energy here, we can start to, be able to read that on what range of wavelength or frequency will we be dealing with. Remember, large energy gap would say large frequency, but a small wavelength. A small energy is a small frequency, but a large wavelength. So those types of things that we learned in general chemistry still need to be present in our mind uh, as we continue forward. All right, IR spectrometer uh, irradiates samples with a bunch of frequencies in the IR range. The frequencies absorbed by the sample tells us what types of functional groups we have present. Types of bonds, and so therefore types of functional groups. Do we have an OH? Do we have an ether, an uh, oxygen sandwiched between two carbons? Do we have a carbonyl, a carbon double bonded to an oxygen? Things like that. Most commonly um, samples are deposited on salt plates. Why it's on a salt plate is because this is an ionic bond, does not absorb in the IR range. Uh, you can also uh, dis have dissolved solvent or embedded in a KBR pellet. But again, we're looking at things that uh, would not absorb in the infrared, so not have covalent bonds. We don't own the only covalent bonds we want present are the ones in our sample. This is what an infrared spectrum usually looks like. Wave number is one over the frequency or one over the uh, the wavelength, excuse me, uh, and it's by percent transmittance. So again, we're looking at uh, zero absorbed versus 100% absorbed, right? So we are looking at a function of absorption. That's why we call these peaks absorption bands. And so um, when we're looking at wave numbers, it is going to be a function of, again, one over lambda or what we can call frequency over speed of light. Wave number is also abbreviated this frequency mu with a little fancy line on top of it. <laughs> um, and so typically the, uh, the units of frequency in IR are called wave numbers. It's a combination of fre frequency and wavelength. And we created the word wave number. They range from 400 over here on the low spectrum to 4,000 on the high spectrum. And they do uh, have three important characteristics. Wave number, where do these peaks show up, right? Where are they on that x-axis, right? Intensity, how far down are they, right? So where do they appear on the y-axis? And shape, are they spiky or are they broad? And we'll call those sharp or broad. Um, and so looking at things like this broad, right? How big is this peak versus these ones? Very, very intense uh, or very, very short, small 
bands there. So we have a couple of things, right? Wave number, where is it on the x-axis? Intensity, where is it on the y? And this is um, spiky. Yes, that's technical term or broad. Awesome. We'll go into signal characteristics a little bit more uh, next lecture. I want to jump to the end, and I think what's really important about section 16 in this chapter is understanding that we won't know what our compound looks like, right? When we do these um, types of spectroscopy or spectrometry, when we're dealing in chapter 14 with IR spectroscopy or mass spectrometry, we are really trying to find the, the structure of the compound. We're trying to see what's present. It's an unknown molecule in a lot of our, our um, examples. Um, and so degrees of unsaturation is really important, specifically for mass spec and determining molecular formula. But IR can tell us the functional groups present. And so when we're looking at uh, an example, what we'll dive into this week is looking at um, I'll give you a molecular formula and I say, figure it out. What's present? Do you, what, where do those carbons and hydrogens go? Do you have a double bond? Do you have a triple bond? And it's really a puzzle. And that's why I like starting with this chapter too. It's really fun and it's really exciting. Now alkanes, fully saturated hydrocarbons, remember alkanes were single bonded carbons with hydrogens. Right? Fully saturated, meaning no double bonds. Everything is sp3 carbon to hydrogen hybridized. Uh, and so looking at the alkane formula, we had this last semester, C to the N, H to the 2N plus 2. When you have that formula, that means everything is fully saturated. No double bonds, no rings. A degree of unsaturation is identifying something that has reduced the number of hydrogens. So unsaturated compounds. Again, we'll look at pentane. Right, let's me remember a little bit of our naming, not much. C to the N, H to the 2N plus 2. Carbon is 5. 2 times 5 is 10, plus 2 is 12. There we have C to the 5, H to the 12. Fully saturated. sp3 hybridized carbons to hydrogens. Now, if we add in a pi bond, what happens is we actually reduce the number of hydrogens by two. So for every one degree of unsaturation, two hydrogens have been removed. If I put in a triple bond, I've put in two degrees of unsaturation, two pi bonds, right? So four hydrogens have been removed. Same thing with a ring. Here's a five-membered ring, cyclopentane. Take a minute, pause the video if you need to, count up how many hydrogens are on there. What is the molecular formula? How many hydrogens? Pause. Unpause. We should count 10. Again, a ring is a degree of unsaturation. Now, we will discuss uh, uh, degrees of unsaturation a little bit more in class and see some practice. There is an equation. Now, another term for degree of unsaturation is called the hydrogen deficiency index. H D I. The hydrogen efficiency in deficiency index is literally counting how many degrees of unsaturation do you have? One HDI equals one ring or one pi bond. Two HDI, you could have two rings or you can have one pi bond plus one ring or you could have two pi bonds and those could be two double bonds or they could be uh, a triple bond, right? So HDI is a really important way of dissecting the molecular formula so that we can decipher what abnormalities, what extra things, pi bonds or rings could we possibly have? And again, it's another piece of the puzzle. We're trying to be Sherlock Holmes's here. So you'll see the two times the number of carbons plus two, the full alkane idea. 
what we want to do in this formula is we're subtracting the number of hydrogens in the molecule, the number of hydrogens we actually have, to see how many are we deficient in, right? How many are we missing? Nitrogen is a plus the number of nitrogens. Why we have to add nitrogen here is because nitrogen only makes three bonds typically. Carbon makes four. So if we see nitrogens, we're actually changing the number of uh, bonds that that atom could be holding, right? Nitrogen typically holds, uh, uh, holds only three bonds instead of four. And we also subtract for halogens. Hal halogens are replacing hydrogens, but they don't, they're not instituting a degree of unsaturation like a ring or a pi bond. And then we divide it by two so that we can see uh, the degree of unsaturation, right? For every two hydrogens, we have one degree of unsaturation. So let's practice with this guy, C4H6. Two times four plus two. That is coming from the idea that we have four carbons. We minus the six hydrogens that we have. There are no nitrogens and there are no halogens. So I leave those options blank. This is the most amount of math that you will do this semester. Yes, you can use a calculator. You don't have to. If you can do it in your head, great. But sometimes organic chemistry, things get weird. And I understand that. So use a calculator if you need to. Two times four is eight plus two is 10. Minus six is four. 4 divided by 2 is 2. So we have two degrees of unsaturation or the hydrogen de uh, deficiency index of 2, which means, again, I could have two rings. That's hard with four carbons. Uh, I could have a pi bond and a ring, right? That might look a little weird to us, but that's okay. We'll practice. And we might have two pi bonds. I'm going to start with the two pi bonds. I think that's sometimes a little bit easier. There, four carbons, two pi bonds. What if we did four carbons and a triple bond? Okay. Excellent, we could have put that triple bond at the end of a chain. All of these satisfy C4H6. What we're doing is we're not trying to find an exact answer here with the hydrogen deficiency index. What we're trying to do is really come up with options, right? You want two rings? this one's tricky. Yep, two fused, three member drinks. How likely is that? Probably not very likely. There's a ring and a pi bond. So there's lots of options still, and you might be thinking, Lauren, what are you doing? Like, why, why are we even trying to consider this? Because when we give you a molecular formula and then the spectroscopy behind it, we want you to be able to have all of the tools in your toolbox, all of the things you, we, that we can start to think of. Do we see rings? Do we see pi bonds? What type of things can we come up with prior to even diving into the instrumentation? Um, and so that's what hydrogen deficiency index will help us with. And we'll practice a lot, don't worry. All right, welcome back. So as we continue our talk on IR spectroscopy today, we want to remember the three things that we're going to be talking about, wave number, intensity, and shape. These three characteristics are going to help us identify uh, what type of functional group is present in our unknown molecule. Speaking of wave number, frequency or wave number for a stretching vibration is dependent on two things. And we kind of hinted toward this last time, bond strength, Right? What two atoms uh, are being held in what kind of way, double, triple, or single bond, and the mass difference of the atoms. All right. So again, looking specifically at the two atoms that are bonded together. This is the calculation for wave number. Right. Remember, this is wave number. And it's very complicated if you look at it, but what we're just doing is dissecting um, and being able to predict uh, where these, these uh, stretching frequencies are going to um, show up, right? So the force constant is in the numerator. So bond strength in the numerator, what that means is as bond strength increases, think about what's gonna happen to the frequency or the wave number. Wave number also increases. Notice how they're proportional. This is in the numerator. So as one increases, 
the other increases, right? Reduce mass in the denominator. So the larger the atoms, right? Technically, in that denominator, the larger the atoms correlates with a lower wave number. Smaller reduced mass, smaller atoms, higher wave number, right? Looking at that denominator being inversely proportional. So a couple of things that we need to think about. Stronger bond, higher fret, uh, stretching frequency, larger mass difference, smaller the atoms, right? Uh, higher stretching frequency. What that's going to mean for us is typically carbons and hydrogens or things with hydrogens are going to appear uh, at a higher wave number, right? Carbons to hydrogens typically appear around 3000. Carbon to deuterium, we didn't do a lot with deuterium if you were in my section for uh, the first semester organic chemistry, um, but we're gonna do a little bit more with it today. Deuterium is heavy hydrogen. It's hydrogen with one proton and one neutron, right? So it is a mass number of two, uh, one proton, so it's hydrogen, right? But it has an, an extra neutron, it's an isotope of hydrogen. So it's called deuterium, it's given a special uh, D symbol. That is a heavier atom, right? So it has a lower frequency. Same thing when we see oxygens to carbons, chlorines to carbons. Again, looking at our second identifying here, triple bonds appear higher than double bonds. Double bonds are higher than single bonds. So again, just whittling down a very simplistic type of structure here. Bonds to hydrogen appear at the far left, the highest wave numbers, um, then the triple bonds, then the double bonds, and then all these single bonds. That a type of um, description here of where these typically show up is based off of the calculation. No, you don't need to calculate. Yes, you need to know the two types of characteristics here to establish a wave number and be able to represent these um, across the board simplistically. Hydrogens, then triple bonds, then double bonds, then single bonds. All right, one more thing. When we're looking at that range from 400 to 4,000, we will only be looking at the range of 1,500 to 4,000 centimeters to the minus one. Below 1,500 is the fingerprint region. It's very, very difficult to analyze, so we usually don't do it. What we want to actually analyze is the diagnostic region. This region above 1,500 uh, centimeters to the minus one is more clear and it provides a better picture as to um, what our compounds functional groups are. So single bonds, very, very difficult to decipher. Double bonds, triple bonds, and bonds to hydrogen, much easier. Because um, molecules might have the same type of covalent bond, things like this, 2-butanol versus 2-propanol, virtually the same uh, IR. Not the same compound though, right? We have uh, C4 versus C3 here, right? And we have different numbers of hydrogens and we have an oxygen here. So when we're looking at this compound, um, looking at their IRs, they're almost indistinguishable, right? These two are almost the exact same. Yes, the, the fingerprint region right here looks different than this one. Right, and that's where if you had a fancy can fancy computer attached to your IR spectrometer and you could look in a database, then that's helpful. Uh, but again, um, be very careful with these. We're going to try our best to just analyze the diagnostic region. I will always give you a molecular formula um, when I want you to ex decipher the actual structure, um, and also uh, usually IRs are just matching. We'll see that in class. Now, comparing the stretching frequencies uh, for different uh, types of bond lengths, right? And bond strengths. So sp3, sp2, sp carbons, we know that those orbitals get smaller, the more s character, right? The sp uh, 
hybrid orbital is smaller and therefore this bond is stronger. Excellent. Um, then the SP, a little bit longer bond length for SP3, right? So SP3 is a longer bond, so it's a weaker bond. SP is a stronger bond, it's held a little bit tighter. Now, uh, that stronger CH bond of the SP hybridized carbon to H uh, has a higher stretching frequency. Again, these are just giving you the numbers, giving you the characteristics. What we see there is typically the best thing to do when given an IR is draw a line right at 3000. If you're less than 3000, all you have is SP3 carbons to hydrogens, right? If you're just above, there's your SP2 carbon to hydrogen. And if you're really far above, there's your SP carbon to hydrogen. So utilizing this image, 30,000 is the general number for CH bonds. Uh, but looking at the hybridization, we do see a spread across uh, around 3,300 to 2,800. All right, it is possible to have a carbon-carbon double bond or a carbon-carbon triple bond that does not have any CHs, right? Um, so just because you uh, don't see anything above 3000 doesn't mean you don't have that hybridization. It just means you don't have the carbon to the hydrogen, right? So remember, hydrogens to atom bonds appear above 3000 or 2800 to three uh, above 3000. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you don't have that type of carbon. So looking at fully uh, substituted carbons, carbon-carbon uh, double bonds, or fully substituted carbon-carbon triple bonds, very important to note. Resonance, what does resonance do? Well, again, with resonance, what actually happens is it lowers the wave number, right? So when we're looking at these two wave numbers, a ketone versus a conjugated ketone, um, what's the difference here? Great question. Resonance makes the bond a little weaker, the pi bond, right? The p bond. When we're looking at that stretching frequency, we're looking at the characteristic of the carbon-carbon double bond. In a conjugated system, when we have resonance, what happens is there's more resonance structures without that carbon-carbon or carbon-oxygen double bond. So what happens to the actual wave number is it gets less, it gets lower. So anything with resonance technically will have a lower wave number. Now, when we see a couple of different carbonyls, which we will definitely get to uh, once we start chapter 19, 20, and 21, uh, conjugated carbonyls have that lower stretching frequency. The same thing happens whether it's a ketone or an ester or an aldehyde, things like that. So just because this carbon group changed to an ester, right, an OR group, doesn't mean that the uh, conjugation idea changes, right? So anytime you have a conjugation where you have uh, two adjacent uh, pi bonds. That conjugation, that resonance will decrease the stretching frequency. Let's talk about intensity next, all right? The strength or the intensity of the signal can vary. When we're talking about that, we're again talking about the y-axis here, weak signal versus strong signal. What do we see? Well, when a bond actually oscillates, it's undergoing uh, that a change in its dipole moment. Right, so the dipole moment includes the distance between the uh, partial charges. And so oscillating that dipole moment creates an electrical field to surround the bond. Yes, there's a mu is equal to E times D. We don't need to know that calculation, but what we do need to know is that the more polar the bond, the greater the opportunity for that change in the dipole moment, right? The interaction between the waves of the IR radiation and that of the electrical field of polarity. So greater the bond polarity, stronger the IR signals right there. Because oxygen to carbon is polar, its dipole moment is already large. A carbon-carbon bond is not polar. 
And so it does not have a large dipole moment. We would have called that a nonpolar bond looking at that carbon, carbon double bond. Carbon oxygen double bond, polar, greater or stronger, more intense signals on the IR. We can see that in the general length between the carbonyl and the alkene, right? Carbon oxygen double bond, also called a carbonyl, carbon carbon double bond, also called an alkene. Again, very, very important here, just some random things that happen. If a bond is completely symmetrical, then the stretching frequency is not observed in the IR spectrum. Uh, this has to do with the idea of symmetry and nonpolarness, right? And there's a complete nonpolar molecule here in this uh, tetramethyl alkene. So looking at uh, the absence of a signal is also very, very important for us. So not only are we going to be looking at the signals, we're also going to be looking at the absence of signals, right? What you see and what you don't see is always going to be important. Last one shape. When we talk about shape, we're talking narrow versus broad. Um, broad typically occurs with OH stretching signals. So when we're looking at this broad signal right here, this is a very characteristic OH stretch. Narrow signals are usually reserved for NHs, CHs, uh, carbon carbons, things like that. Why is the OH so special? You guessed it, hydrogen bonding. The hydrogen bonding that occurs actually lengthens this bond right here, that OH covalent bond. Now that is not an arrow for a dipole moment. This is a lengthening. Imagine that oxygen on the right is actually pulling the hydrogen towards itself in the hydrogen bond. Here's our H bond, the intermolecular force that we all know and love. That hydrogen bond is literally pulling the covalent bond of its adjacent alcohol molecule and thus weakening it. And so as a result, what we actually get is a bunch of different types, varying strengths of OH bonds in our sample dependent on where is the length of the OH bond, the covalent bond based off of the hydrogen bonding that's taking place. But the OH stretch signal will be narrow if we use a dilute solution of an alcohol and if it's prepared in a solvent incapable of hydrogen bonding, right? So um, very difficult to do, but it is possible. And what that usually looks like is this. We do see that there is a stretch or a broadening of a little peak and then a free OH peak. Um, and the free OH peak would be one that is free of hydrogen bonding when it's dilute, it can look like that when it isn't dilute or when it, there's too much alcohol or if there's a, um, a solvent that you use that is a polar solvent, um, doesn't need to be polar protic. Technically, it could be a hydrogen bond participator if it has an oxygen or a nitrogen or a fluorine in it, right? So any hydrogen bonding capabilities, you'll see this broad signal. Typically for our uh, in-class practice problems, we see broad signals. Hydrogen bonding also occurs in carboxylic acids, which you see uh, on the right-hand side participating in hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding here and here. This is what we would call a dimer. Dimer two molecules uh, reacting together. Notice how broad this, uh, this OH stretch is from the carboxylic acid. It's just like, hello, I'm a carboxylic acid. Why it's pokey right down here, yeah. Why it's narrow right down here is because this most likely is from our CHs overlapping with the OH from up here, right? OH is the broad part and it's overlapping, it's expanding. Um, past 3,000 rather than staying put at 3,400 centimeters to the minus one. Now, um, that is from a specifically carboxylic acid because the hydrogen bonding is more pronounced because of the two 
locations of hydrogen bonding, dimer meaning two molecules interacting together. The only time we also saw dimers last semester was when we talked about uh, hydroboration oxidation and how BH3 technically forms dimers with itself. Now, signal shape for uh, amines, uh, nitrogens to hydrogens, amines. Uh, typically, we'll see primary and secondary amines exhibit NH stretching signals. Um, tertiary amines do not show that NH because remember, a tertiary amine is going to be one with three R groups. So let's just remember our primary, secondary, and tertiary idea. It's counting up the number of carbons that are on the nitrogen itself. So a primary amine means it has one carbon and two hydrogens. A secondary amine means it has two carbons and therefore one hydrogen. A tertiary amine will have all carbons, so no hydrogen. So we wouldn't see anything in this upper range around 35 to 3400. Now, for every hydrogen, we usually see two signals, or for every hydrogen, we see the one signal, excuse me. So for a primary amine, we will see a signal for each hydrogen. For our secondary amine, we see one signal for that one hydrogen. They, they are broadened a little bit, but not as much as the, um, the OH. Again, two NH bonds can vibrate in two different ways. There's the symmetric stretching where they go out and in at the same time, or they can do asymmetric stretching. And so that's why we see two signals. It's not technically one per hydrogen, it's based off of the combination of stretching. Half the molecules are stretching one way, the rest of the molecules are stretching another way. So to analyze a spectra, we're gonna look at table 14.2. You can look it up in your textbook now, but we're gonna look it up uh, together. And we are going to focus on the diagnostic region. We're gonna check for double, triple bonds and atoms to hydrogen. And we're gonna look at the wave number, the intensity and the shape. And that's how we are going to identify what we need to know about the molecule's functional group. I like this chart too. I'm a big chart or conceptual mapper. Um, whatever works for you is great. I like to give you a couple of different ways to look at, an, um, at these concepts. Uh, but again, this one is a really great chart in your textbook. When looking at the 2700 to 4000 region, that's the hydrogen to atom region, draw a line at 3000 and focus on what signals come around it, right? And be able to identify these five functional groups from that range. We have learned numerous reactions previously, and I think that's the biggest thing that I wanna take home from uh, first semester organic chemistry. We will be in class being use IR to distinguish between two compounds as well as understanding an unknown compound. But IR spectroscopy at the end of the day is used by organic chemists who say, hey, I want to take cyclohexanol and I want to make cyclohexanone, right? I want to take an alcohol and make it a ketone. How do I know if I did it? Clear liquid, making a clear liquid, how do I know? We typically use IR spectroscopy for that. So that's what we're going to be at the end of the day trying to use IR for. Not only is it to decipher unknown compounds, but it is to distinguish between reactants and products. How do we know when our reaction ends? Excellent.